Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this uh, first Friday of February. Um, glad to be done with January, that's for sure. <laughs> um, we've got a, a, a great um, presentation today with L Max Liebeskund, um with JP Morgan Chase. Excited to hear his presentation on um, workforce and racial um, disparities within workforce outcomes. Um, before we get started, I'd like to say thank you to all of our anchor investors, um, WorkSource Georgia, DHS, um, WorkSource Metro Atlanta, Career, Atlanta Career Rise, Goodwill, uh, Metro Atlanta Chamber, First Step Staffing, and our newest anchor investor that just joined us is BDI. So welcome and thank you for supporting Max and all that we do. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Daniela Perry, Vice President of the Georgia Chamber. Um, and again, I, I have to just say thank you, Daniela. You have done a fabulous job on um, pulling together such wonderful Max Minute sessions. So I'm looking forward to today's session, but thank you for all you do for Max. Yeah, thanks so much, Amy. I'm really excited here to have Max Liebenskind um, from the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute. Um, I think as we're all, you know, really thinking about what workforce looks like and where those opportunities are, we need to be really honest about where the gaps are and what um, areas we want to focus on first so that we're able to really propel people into workforce development. So um, really excited for Max to go through this report that J.P. Morgan Chase um, Institute has put together. So Max, um, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks so much to both of you, Daniela and Amy. Uh, and thank you, everybody uh, who is attending. I'm going to share some slides uh, right now, and I will uh, use those to talk through the presentation. So can I get a quick thumbs up, Daniela? All good? OK, great. Great. So um, as Daniela said, my name is Max Liebeskind. I am a researcher at the JP Morgan Chase Institute. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about who we are in a second. Um, but the report that I'm going to present today is some research that we put out uh, several months ago, looking at using our bank account data to look at racial gaps in financial outcomes. Um, and so to start, before I talk about the research, uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute, mainly because if I had to guess, uh, most of you probably have not heard of it. So the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute is really a think tank that is part of the bank, J.P. Morgan Chase. And what we do is that we use the bank's data um, data on tens of millions of uh, de-identified anonymized customers across the United States. We use that data to conduct research on a wide range of economic subjects. And so since we were founded in 2015, we've done research on topics related to household income, household finances, trying to understand how do households uh, manage volatility in their incomes and in their spending. We've done research on labor, mar on labor markets, on unemployment, on healthcare. And then we've also done a whole bunch of research directly related to small businesses, trying to understand how do small businesses manage their cash flows um, and trying to produce kind of better economic statistics on local commerce and on, on, on city level economies. So kind of the overarching theme here is that we think that if we use this incredibly rich data set from tens of millions of anonymized bank customers across the United States, we can provide policymakers, business leaders, folks like yourselves with a better clearer, more granular picture of the US economy. And so that's kind of the, the, the overall context for the JP Morgan Chase Institute. Um, what I'm gonna do today is that I'm gonna present a report um, that we put out uh, last February on racial gaps in financial outcomes. And, and just to, you don't, have to, you don't have to read this slide, this is a pretty long slide, but just to give a, um, a little bit of context, I think what I'll do is that I'll kind of go a couple of slides at a time and then I'll pause and answer any questions. So throughout the presentation, if you have questions, feel more than free to present them uh, or to post them rather in the Zoom chat box. Um, but with that, I'll start talking about the report. And you know, I think as, as probably just about everybody on this call is aware, um, there is a longstanding history of, of research in economics and across many fields uh, examining gaps in income, in wealth, in economic outcomes between black families and Hispanic families and white families, looking at these racial gaps in economic outcomes. And most of the research that has been done on this subject historically has either looked at long-term trends. So for example, looking at long-term gaps in wealth or in income between ethnic groups and racial groups, or it's looked at kind of major institutional factors that influence these gaps. So for example, looking at how do disparities in education or disparities in housing 
or other or forms of bias? How do those all contribute to gaps in economic outcomes? What we're trying to do with this paper is that we're trying to add kind of a different lens to this big picture question about racial disparities in economic and financial outcomes. And specifically what we're looking at is we're trying to understand how do short-term disparities in income and in, and, and in household finances contribute to broader economic disparities? And so specifically what I'm gonna to present today is answers to, to three questions. The first question that we're gonna talk about is simply documenting the size of gaps in income and in wealth in liquid assets between black and Hispanic families on the one hand and white families on the other. Another question is looking at short-term income volatility and trying to understand how, do, how does short-term income volatility, fluctuations in families' income, for example, due to job loss, how do those fluctuations contribute to gaps in spending and in, and in uh, household well-being? And then the final question is trying to understand when we see these gaps, what is driving them? So again, just kind of to summarize, we're gonna start just by documenting the facts about gaps in liquid assets. Then we're gonna look at these kind of event studies about income volatility. And finally, we're gonna try to explain what the event studies show us. So um, I believe there maybe are some questions coming in the chat. I'll pause in a moment. Before I do, um, I wanna tell you a little bit about our data asset. So as I said, our starting point for all of the research that we do at the JP Morgan Chase Institute is the universe of Chase checking, Chase deposit account customers across the United States, which is somewhere uh, around 30 to 40 million households. Now what we did for this report is that we were able to link, just for the purpose of this report, we were able to link those anonymized uh, checking account customers to uh, self-reported race info based on voter registration files. So in three states, one of which is Georgia, the other two that we have are Florida and Louisiana. In Florida, Georgia, and Louisiana, uh, when you register to vote, you have the option of self-reporting your race on your voter registration form. And we were able to link those voter registration forms to our customer information, again, only for the purpose of this report, not for the bank, but we were able to link those two sources. And in doing so, we built a data asset of about 1.8 million Chase, Chase customer families whose self-reported race we know. And so in total, um, if you look at the chart here, roughly 50, about 47% of the customers in our sample are white, about 22% are Hispanic, and about 25% are black, and then uh, somewhere around 5% are Asian or other. Because that's such a small portion of the sample, we end up not talking about that. So for the remainder of this report, we're gonna talk about the bulk of this sample, which are black, Hispanic, and white families in three states, Florida, Georgia, and Louisiana, all of whom are Chase customers, all of whose self-reported race we've been able to identify, uh, and all of, whom are, who, all of whom use their Chase checking account and their Chase deposit accounts kind of on a regular basis as their main source of banking. Now, there are a couple caveats about this data. So everything I'm gonna to present to you um, is only based on uh, families in these three states. By definition, everyone in our sample has a bank account. And so we're excluding households who are unbanked. Also, because we're using voter registration information to find the, to, to identify uh, race, everyone in our sample is by definition a registered voter. And so kind of the upshot of this is that our sample, the Chase Bank sample, it tends to overrepresent Black and Hispanic families a bit overrepresents the urban population and also overrepresents younger people relative to the overall US population. So I think kind of the way to think about this research is that probably what we're telling you is pretty representative of the United States as a whole based on the benchmarking that we've done, but it's, it's particularly representative kind of for the middle of the income distribution. So very low income people, for example, folks without bank accounts are not gonna be captured by our research. Also for other reasons, very, very high income people won't be captured by our research, but kind of the results that I show you, I think you can you can think of them as being representative for kind of the disparities that exist for the bulk of American households in the middle of the income distribution. Um, with that, before I go to the next slide, I'll pause quickly. And uh, Daniela, if there are any um, if there are any questions, I'm I'm happy to answer them. Hey, Max, I think the only question um, was kind of just around how y'all are able to link the data and kind of how that connection works um, for some folks that are um, like to get in the weeds with data. Um, so I don't know if you have any more that you could share yeah. around that. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so the way to think of it is that we went through we went through a process where if you think about the information that a bank has about its customers, um, you know, we know a customer's name, we know a customer's date of birth, we know like the zip code that they live in. And all of those pieces of information, zip code, name, date of birth, are also on a voter registration files. Uh, incidentally, I should say voter registration files, I believe for all 50 states are, are publicly available. In some cases you have to purchase them, but um, voter registration is actually not, it's not, uh, it's not held privately. It's, it's public information that researchers can use. And so what we did is that we were able to link the voter registration files in these three states with our Chase customer files. And you can think of it as us saying, you know, where if a voter and a customer match, they have the same name, they have the same birthday, and they live in the same zip code or on this at the same address, then we would consider that a match. And because the voter registration information includes, in some cases, includes uh, the race that the voter checked off when they registered to vote, in that way, we're able to identify the self-reported race of the customer. Now, I, I should I should just emphasize uh, because technically we, we are, of course, of JP Morgan Chase Institute. We are part of a bank. We're a part of JP Morgan Chase, and so we did this just for the purpose of, of this report. Um, and all of the research that we do, as you can kind of tell, uh, it's kind of meant for public consumption and, and and trying to provide you know provide useful information to the world. Um, so the bank itself is legally not allowed to collect race information, and of course. Like none of this went back to the bank. Um, in fact, I think we we destroyed the data after. Um, but it was it was a really kind of clever way for us to get at this data, which then we can use to do this this broader research about racial gaps and financial outcomes. Great. I think that's um, all the questions we have so far. Um, so we're ready to dig in. Cool. So with that, I will go to our first uh, set of our first finding. And as I said, the, the first thing that we look at in this report is we simply try to document the, the gaps that exist in income and in liquid assets between racial groups. And so let's start here with gaps in income. So the overall finding of this slide is that the median Black and Hispanic family earns roughly 70 cents in income for every dollar that the white family earns, that the median white family earns. And, and when we're talking about income here, we're talking about what we call take-home income. So you can think of that as the income that actually hits your bank account after tax withholdings, after any other withholdings. Now, I think one thing that's interesting about the graph here is that what we've done is we've plotted that ratio for every decile of the income distribution. So I told you that at the middle of the distribution, at the median, the as you can see on this graph, uh, the average black family earns 71 cents for every dollar that the average white family earns. But even if you look at the very high end of the distribution, so the 90th percentile, um, the 90th percentile black family earns only 60 cents for the 90th percentile white family. And similarly, at the very bottom of the distribution, the gap is roughly 20, it's roughly 79 cents to the dollar. So I think kind of the takeaway from this slide is that really across the entire income distribution, you see these gaps uh, in income between black and white households and between Hispanic and white households. And I think, you know, you, 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 I think people are probably sort of aware of this. You could, you could get this information from other data. You don't need our bank data to find, to, to discover this. But I think what's interesting is to see that, you know, while everybody's aware of the gaps in income, that it, the racial gaps in income that exists, what's maybe not always so obvious is that they really persist across the entire income distribution. So whether you're looking at the lowest income families, the middle income families, or, or really the highest income families, at every place in that distribution, there's a fairly sizable gap in income between black, Hispanic, black and Hispanic families on the one hand and white families on the other. Now on this next slide, um, we do the exact same exercise, but instead of looking at incomes, we're looking at liquid assets. And by liquid assets, what do we mean? I'm referring to kind of that the cash buffer that you keep in your most accessible bank accounts. So your checking account, your savings account, uh, money market accounts, certificates of deposit. Again, we like to think of liquid assets as kind of that first line of defense that you would go to uh, if you had that kind of, if you had an emergency, it's kind of your, your rainy day fund, so to speak. And so what we see here is that much like with income, there are significant gaps in liquid assets between black and Hispanic families and white families. The gaps in liquid assets are actually quite a bit larger than in income. So I showed you on the last slide that the median Black or Hispanic family has somewhere between 70 and 75 cents 
for every dollar in income that the median white family earns. But when we look at it, liquid assets on this slide, the gap is larger. Instead of 70 or 75 cents, it's 32 cents or 47 cents. So in some sense, I think that's intuitive, right? If you think of your wealth or your liquid assets as something that you accumulate over many years, over many years based on the income that you earn, then it makes sense that if two groups have an income disparity, their liquid asset disparity is only gonna be larger because it's based on the accumulation of assets over time. But again, I think the same message that I delivered on the last slide applies here too, which is that across the entire distribution of liquid assets, um, there's really a pretty sizable disparity between black and Hispanic families and white families. Um, maybe I'll make, I'll make one other comment. Obviously kind of racial wealth disparities are a topic that are in the news a lot uh, that you know, politicians and other leaders are kind of talking about, thinking about quite a lot. And I would say that this slide uh, and, and this result is our attempt at discussing that question of racial wealth disparities using the data that we have. And of course, the majority of a household's wealth, especially for high wealth households, is going to be in illiquid assets, right? In their home or in stock holdings. Or, um, we don't see that. We only see checking accounts and savings accounts and other types of liquid accounts. And so you can think of this as being kind of a subset of the, wealth, of the overall wealth gap. In fact, if you look at total wealth, which we don't report here, the gap is going to be even larger. It's going to be more like nine to one. So I will, I'll pause again. Uh, I can't actually see the Zoom, the Zoom chat. So Danielle, I'll, I'll turn to you again if there are any questions. No, we can keep moving through. Great. Okay, so where we are so far is that we've documented uh, the racial gaps that exist in income and in liquid assets. Uh, on this next slide, um, we're breaking that down by geography. I don't think there's a whole lot to say about this slide. To some extent, um, the gaps but the black white gaps are somewhat larger in Louisiana than in Georgia and Florida. Hispanic white gaps are somewhat larger in Florida. Um, but broadly, I would say that these gaps persist across all the geographies that we look at. And I think that's in line with other, with other data um, from public sources. Okay, so just quickly pausing again, what, what we've talked about so far is all we've done, all I've done so far is just document a few facts about gaps that exist in income and in liquid assets. For the rest of the report is, I think, a bit more interesting and a bit more novel. And what we're doing for the rest of the report is that we're going to look at some event studies to try to understand how households respond to changes in income and how those responses vary across racial groups. And the kind of the overarching question that I think you, you want to have in your mind as I present this is, you know, when families' income fluctuates, usually if a family loses income, they're going to have to cut spending. And so a question is how much does the, do families need to cut spending when they face an income loss? You would hope that families don't have to cut spending too much. If a family has to cut their spending a lot when they lose a job, for example, then that has a real impact on their well-being. So that's kind of the motivating question for everything that I'm, to, I'm going to present from here on out is how much does household consumption fluctuate? How much does spending fluctuate when income fluctuates? And I'll start with the slide here, which I'll explain. So what we're looking at here is that we're looking at an event study of job loss. And the question that we're asking is, how much does a family's spending, how much, or how much does their consumption fluctuate when they lose a job? And so what you see in this graph is that on the x-axis, um, month zero represents the month in which a family begins receiving unemployment insurance. So you can think of that as the first month in which a family has lost their job. And what we show here is that if you look at all three of these lines, a family's spending when they lose their job, when they lose a job, drops by about 10% on average, right? So you can see that once you get to month zero, month one, two, three, four, um, that the, all three of those lines are somewhere around negative 10%. And so the interpretation here is that when a family experiences job loss, on average, their spending declines by about 10%. Now that's probably not surprising, right? In, in normal times, so everything that we're presenting here was all this research is from before the coronavirus. And in normal times, if you lose your job, um, even if you get unemployment insurance, you're gonna have, you know, you're gonna experience a loss of income. And so it's not surprising that you might also need to cut their spending, cut your spending. Now, what's interesting about this graph is that if you look at the green line, which represents white families, white families cut their spending by somewhere around 8% on average when they experience job loss whereas Black and Hispanic families cut their spending by more like 11 or 12%. And 
And so I think the message here is that, of course, for all families, regardless of race, job loss is a difficult experience. Uh, it creates a real burden and families have to cut spending. Uh, and, and really right here, we're actually looking at what we call non-durable spending, which means spending on things like groceries. So we're really looking right here at cuts to essential spending, fewer trips to the grocery store or to the pharmacy. All families have to cut spending when they, when they experience a job loss on average, but the cuts are larger for black and Hispanic families. And one way to quantify this is to say for every dollar of income that you lose, how much does your spending fall? And the answer is that a dollar drop in income for black families corresponds to a 46 cents drop in spending for Hispanic families, 43 cents, but for white families, only 28 cents. And so kind of the overall message of this slide is that yes, while all families um, experience real burden uh, upon job loss, the consumption drop is actually larger for black and Hispanic families. Now, very likely the question that you're asking is, well, why is this the case, right? What is the, what is the reason, what, is the, what are the factors that are driving these disparities between black and Hispanic families and white families in how they respond to job loss? And the answer it turns out goes back to something that I talked about earlier, which is the gaps in liquid assets and in financial assets. And so what we did, and I'll, I'll explain this graph, this graph in a second, but what we did is that we, we, we computed how big are the gaps? So, so those numbers that I presented on the last on the last slide, for a dollar drop in income, for a dollar drop in income, how large is the drop in spending? I told you that for black families it's 46 cents, for white families it's 28 cents. And so what you see in this graph on the left hand side, that's an 18 cent gap, right? Black families have a 46 cent drop, white families have uh, a 28 cent drop. So there's an 18 cent difference in how responsive their consumption is to changes in income. The question that we asked is, what if we control for the fact that there are differences in liquid assets and in financial assets? And what we find is that once you account for the fact that there are these disparities between racial groups in liquid assets and in financial assets, these differences in the, these gaps in the response to unemployment insurance or to unemployment also go away. So, as I said, if we just focus on the black-white gap, the overall gap in the spending response is 18 cents. But once we control for financial asset buffer, the financial asset buffer is basically all of your liquid assets as well as your stocks uh, and your retirement accounts. So this, this kind of accessible financial assets. Once we control for that buffer, the gap in the gap in the response to unemployment goes away. And so I think kind of the overall message of this slide and, and the takeaway is that there are these big gaps in liquid assets and in financial assets between racial groups. Those gaps in turn cause families, cause these gaps uh, in consumption smoothing between families. And so in a hypothetical world where there were no gaps in assets between racial groups, we would expect that the response to unemployment insurance would be about the same. The, the response to job loss would be about the same. Now, really quickly before I, I turn to any questions, uh, I think it's important to think about why this matters. So one reason that this matters is that, you know, most of the time when we're focused, when we're thinking about racial gaps and economic outcomes, we're probably focused on the big, big picture questions like gaps in wealth, long-term gaps in, in economic outcomes and in income. But I think the reason that these short-term questions matter, for example, how does the response to job loss differ? The reason that it matters is that if a family has a much worse experience with job loss, that can carry through throughout, you know, in later years throughout the rest of their lives and make it more difficult uh, to pick themselves up, to return, um, to return to work, to build up the savings buffer that they may have spent down. And so in some sense, if we were able to, you know, reduce the gaps that exist with these short-term experiences like unemployment, that could have some impact on the bigger picture questions of income and opportunity and wealth. Um, that you know tend to be more in the news and that folks tend to think about as more representative of a family's overall well-being. Okay, with that, uh, I've said a lot about job loss and, and, and the disparities in the consumption response to job loss. So Danielle, if there are any questions, I'll, I'll pause right now. Yeah, Max, um, we have one, um, just how job loss was identified for these individuals and was that for folks that may have um, qualified for unemployment or applied for unemployment or how did y'all determine that these individuals had experienced job loss? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
So the answer is that it's, it, is, it is based on unemployment insurance. And the way to think about it is that we are, we are actually able to see people receiving unemployment insurance in our data. Um, so as many of you may be aware, when, when a family receives unemployment insurance, there are two ways that you can receive unemployment insurance. One is that you can get, uh, is, one is by prepaid debit card. Another is by direct deposit. And so what we see in our data is that we see direct deposited unemployment insurance benefits. We're able to actually identify those transactions. Um, and in doing so, we identify job loss, right? So, so when, for example, in this graph, month zero in this graph represents the first month in which a family receives unemployment insurance, the first month where we see that transaction. And you know, as you can see in this graph, um, families spending tends to drop really one month before they begin receiving unemployment insurance. And that's not surprising because again, all of this is before COVID. So in normal times, you know, you probably, a family or an individual becomes unemployed in month negative one, and it may take them a few weeks before the unemployment insurance check actually hits their bank account. And so in all likelihood, they're unemployed by month negative one. In month zero, they begin, they actually begin receiving unemployment. And then, you know, potentially they remain unemployed for some months after. Um, so, so that, that's, that's the, that's the source of the job loss identification. Um, we have, we've done a lot of research and, and we have some more coming out, uh, next week. We've done a lot of research looking at unemployment insurance during the pandemic, not in the lens of, of racial gaps, um, but just trying to understand kind of the impacts of the extended unemployment insurance that the, the federal government put into place. Um, and so I'm happy to talk to you about that another time. I, I, I will say, I think one other implication of this finding is that when you think, so, you know, obviously many of you um, being in the business community think about unemployment insurance in one way or another, um, because you think about the folks who work at your organizations and at your businesses. And um, obviously a, 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 a big question that folks were asking, I think, especially over the summer, is when the federal government was paying out a $600 per week supplement, unemployment insurance supplement, um, there was a lot of question of how this was impacting families, how was it impacting their spending? Um, and also, was it, was it discouraging families from looking for work? And so we're gonna put out research on that uh, next week. Um, but one thing I will say in the context of this racial gaps work that I'm presenting today, when you think about supplemental unemployment insurance and all of the debates that are happening in Washington about you know, whether it should be $300 or $400 and how long should it extend, um, it's, it's in, I, think it's, I think it's probably true that unemployment insurance is even, has an even greater impact on black and Hispanic families in terms of propping up their spending than it does for white families. One way to think about that is imagine what this picture would look like. Imagine how much larger the spending drop would be at job loss uh, if a family didn't have unemployment insurance at all. And the fact that there are these racial disparities in, in the response suggests that kind of the, the impact of unemployment insurance is probably a bit different um, for black and Hispanic families than for white families. Though again, all, all families across all three groups experience real burden at, at job loss. And I think we've shown that pretty clearly with the graph. Um, any, yeah. any other questions? No, that's it. But thanks, Max. I think we've all been really curious to see, you know, um, really good data on what the impact of having the expanded unemployment insurance is. So I know we'll um, look that out and um, be excited to see what y'all have found. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So just a, a couple more uh, slides before before I, I close out and ask allow. And then at that, when I finish them, any of you are welcome to ask kind of more general questions and I'm happy to say. So, um, what I've presented so far is we looked at this job, this event study of, un, of unemployment. How does family spending respond to unemployment? Now, the kind of mirror image of that is to ask, well, what happens if a family experiences an increase in income, right? So when you lose your job, that's, you know, that generally constitutes a decline in income. But what about if somebody, you know, what if you get a big influx of cash uh, at once? How does that impact your spending? And to answer that question about how does spending respond to an increase in income, we look at an event study of tax refunds. And so again, as all of you are no doubt aware, um, every year, mostly in February, March, and April, uh, the vast majority of American families receive a tax refund after they file their taxes. Um, we have shown in other work that tax refunds constitute a major liquidity event for households. I think the average tax refund, if I'm remembering correctly, is somewhere around $3,000 um, 
for I think the majority of families, a tax refund is their largest single in the day on which they receive a tax refund is their largest inflow of the year to their bank account. And so not surprisingly, when families get a tax refund, their spending tends to spike. And if you look at the graph on the top, um, what we're showing here, so the, the x-axis isn't labeled, it should be, but what we're showing here is that uh, right where my mouse is, that's the day on which families receive a tax refund. And what you can see is that on the day of receiving a tax refund, um, spending, total spending jumps quite a lot and it kind of remains elevated. And the statistic that we compute is that within 30 days, 30 days after receiving a tax refund, Black and Hispanic families have spent roughly 50% of the tax refund on average. White families have spent only about 38%. And so in some sense, the finding here is the same as the finding on unemployment insurance, just reversed, which is that if you give uh, families who have low liquid assets, Black and Hispanic families tend to have lower liquid assets. So if you give a family that has low liquid assets a big cash infusion, they're going to tend to bump their spending quite a bit. That kind of makes sense. You can think of this as, you know, when folks get, uh, when folks get a tax refund, they might go and make a big purchase, buy a refrigerator, buy a TV, buy a car. Um, that they previously hadn't had enough money to, to, to buy. And so naturally, it's not surprising that the spending effect is larger for Black and Hispanic families whose liquidity tends to be lower than for white families. Now, what we show in the bottom graph here is again, if you control for the fact that Black and Hispanic families tend to have lower liquid assets than white families, once you control for that, the gaps mostly go away. Um, so for example, if we look within the same quartiles of liquid assets, kind of the spending response, which tends to be roughly the same across racial groups and that black, that black, white and Hispanic white disparity largely goes away. So I, I just wanna pause here. I think the, the overall kind of message of this report and of a lot of the research we've done is that we're looking at these questions of consumption smoothing and trying to understand how how capable are families of smoothing their consumption around big fluctuations in income? Whether that's a large, whether that's a big decrease in income like job loss, a big increase in income like tax refunds. And I, I think the reason this matters, as I said, is that you know, in economics, we tend to think of consumption smoothing as being really important for families to maintain their well-being, right? Even if we're looking at the tax refund side, you want a family to be able to go to the doctor or purchase a refrigerator when they need the refrigerator or when they need to go to the doctor. And it's actually very disheartening. It's, it's a problem uh, if families are waiting until they get that cash inflow to buy the fridge or to buy the car or to visit the doctor. And yet what we show in this graph and in other research is that that is exactly what happens. When families receive a tax refund, they increase their spending on healthcare, they increase their spending on uh, durable goods like refrigerators, on non-durable goods like groceries. Similarly, on the, on the flip side, if we're thinking about job loss, um, you know, you want families to, especially when families are experiences kind of experiencing kind of short unemployment spells, um, you hope that they're able to maintain their well-being, maintain their livelihoods for that period of unemployment. And um, what we've shown, I think, in both of these in both of these event studies, is that you know there is there are, families do not smooth consumption perfectly, and a big part of the reason that families don't smooth consumption is these gaps in liquid assets. And so I think our message to policymakers and to, to nonprofit leaders and, and to business leaders is that to the extent that you're able to think of policies and programs that help families to build up their liquid assets, um, that's gonna carry through, that's gonna have a lot of benefits uh, in terms of allowing families to kind of increase their well-being across time rather than, rather than just purchasing what they need when, when they have the money. Um, so with that, I will, I will pause. I'll keep my uh, screen share up in case folks have questions where I, th that I can refer back to the slides for. But uh, I'm gonna pause the presentation here. Uh, and again, thank you all so much for listening. I, I do hope it's been interesting and I am more than happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Max. And I'll um, kick us off, but everyone feel free um, to go through. And I know I shared the report too. So if you have questions in the full report, um, there's a lot of really great data and visualizations in there too. But um, Max, I know you talked too about, um, you know, how these, you know, liquid assets are twice as large or these racial gaps, basically. Um, and thinking kind of too about, you know, 
how if we could really have proactive steps now in the short term, it really would help long term um, opportunities. But we want to really think about kind of the day to day. Um, how should workforce developers really be thinking about what kind of supports could be helpful kind of in these day to day things to maybe um, allow individuals to get to a better job or, you know, go back and do some reskilling or get a certificate through our technical college system, you know, what kind of supports could be um, helpful to, again, kind of facilitate some of that um, short-term growth, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, well, let me, let me have a, a couple of answers. So I think um, one question that, that we've asked a lot at the Institute and that's kind of, that, that we passed on to other folks in the bank uh, is thinking about, what programs can we create um, to try to help families build liquid assets? Um, and one thing that we've thought about is, you know, if you think, so for example, I presented the, the case of a tax, I presented the event study of tax refunds. And as I said, when families receive a tax refund, uh, it, it, that really represents a huge inflow to their bank account. Um, and we do actually see that families save uh, quite, a, quite a large portion of that. Um, but one thing that folks can think about is how can you encourage households to save money in the months where they may have particularly high inflows, right? So there are some months, uh, for example, when you receive a tax refund, when a household's income tends to be quite a bit higher than normal. Uh, so tax refund season is one, uh, to the extent that households get bonuses like Christmas bonuses, holiday bonuses, that's another. And thinking about these specific moments where income is highest, and how can we encourage, how can we design programs that encourage families to take some savings out of those moments to kind of um, really consciously save and build up their liquid buffer? Um, I think that's that's really important. And so, you know, we've, we've had some thoughts uh, based on our research of, of doing, of creating programs exactly like that uh, within Chase. And I think there are kind of similar things that exist where if you, if you can identify the moments where families are most able to save and you have a program in, in place that makes it really easy to save, then that can help families to build their liquid their liquid assets. Now, you know, to your question, what can employers do? Uh, for one, you know, helping helping families to simply be aware of these programs is really good. Um, you know, another 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 thought is, you know, employers are obviously it, employers are the ones that are actually writing the writing the paychecks, um, and so in some sense, an employer has a better insight, has a better view of an employee's income than just about anyone. And so you could imagine some employers designing programs like this. So for example, um, in months with five Fridays, families tend to get more pay, tend to get three paychecks if they're paid on a bi-weekly basis. Um, and so those tend to be months where families' income is higher than normal. And so you can imagine employers kind of giving their employees the option of taking some portion out of that fifth Friday paycheck and putting it away to savings. So I think kind of one answer is like, just be, being cognizant and, and, and really being being intentional uh, and thinking of these kind of creative ways that you can make it easy uh, for folks to save um, in a way that otherwise might, otherwise not, might not be obvious, that's a really good way to help families build liquid assets. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something that's so helpful. So, you know, once those things do come down the road, um, you can actually, you know, afford to make sure you get all your medications. If, you know, your fridge does die, then you're able to make sure you have fresh food um, for your family. Um, we do have one question um, in the chat and another from Amy as well. Um, but does the data show any periods where there was an increase in income equity for minorities? And if so, what were those contributing factors? So were there kind of periods throughout the year that maybe you saw less of a gap um, than kind of what was the average over the year? That is, that's a good question. I don't know the answer um, because, yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer. Uh, all, all of this report, this entire report is based on, I think, two or either two or three years of data. Um, I believe it's 20, 2016 through 2018. So I think it's three years of data. And, but we didn't look at kind of variation over time, mostly because there, there were no, there were no major financial events in 2016 to 2018 that you would expect to have like a big effect on, on racial disparities, right? Um, but it's, so, what, it, what is true is that Black and Hispanic families, uh, we don't show this here, but I think we, we've shown it, we show it in the report, I believe. Black and Hispanic families do tend to get larger tax refunds 
than white families. And again, that's largely, be, that's mostly a factor of um, having lower incomes. Um, the earned income tax credit, which uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, you know, tends to accrue to low income people. And because black and Hispanic families are disproportionately uh, low income, um, it's more likely that they receive the earned income tax credit, which drives up the size of their tax refund. And so, uh, it may be the case, I would guess that the gap in income kind of shrinks at tax refund season. Um, but we haven't shown that explicitly, but I wouldn't be surprised if that were the case. But again, as, as you see here on this graph that I'm showing now, um, you know, that, that to the extent that the gap does decline in tax refund season, it's kind of making up for the large gap that exists throughout the year. And that's, I think, exactly why you see this bigger spike in spending at tax refunds by Black and Hispanic families, because there's kind of this need to, to make up for spending that that they weren't able to that they weren't able to do during the parts of the year when they didn't have enough money. And again, I mean that's that's kind of true across the board, right? There's also a big spike in spending for white families. It's just not as large on average because, as I said, white families tend to have a larger liquid asset buffer. Yeah, absolutely. I think those consistent gaps that we're seeing um, just, you know, make it impossible for um, so many minority families to, you know, to fill that um, gap throughout the year. Um, we also do have another question um, about what are y'all's future plans for updating this report? Is it something that y'all um, have gotten a lot of interest in or kind of how are y'all thinking about maybe some of your research priorities um, moving forward in the next year or so? Yeah, um, I'm glad you asked. Um, so. We have done, and I, I don't think I don't think I've presented it, Daniela, to, to this group or to any of the other uh, folks that you work with with the Georgia Chamber of Commerce. Um, but we have really the institute has really spent most of the past year uh, doing trying to use our data to provide information about the about the economic impacts of COVID, right? And and we've been I mean we've been really fortunate to be in this in this amazing position where we have nearly real time data on. The U.S. economy on household finances, and of course, one of the all, many of the big, big questions that have that folks have been asking over the past several months is how have households' finances been responding to the COVID pandemic, to job loss, to all of the government programs, whether that's unemployment insurance or the stimulus payments, uh, or on the business side, the the, the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program. And so, we've actually done research on we have already done research on all of those topics, and we're continuing to do research. Um, so I'll, I'll give one example to answer the question. Um, one thing that we've, that we've shown, uh, we just released this report several weeks ago, is we looked at how have families' liquid assets changed during the pandemic. And what we find actually, which is interesting, is that liquid assets have increased during the pandemic, such that the median family's liquid assets in October of 2020, I believe, so don't quote me on this, I will send the report so that you can all look at it, but I believe in October, the median family's liquid assets was roughly 60% higher than it had been the previous year. That's true for low-income households. It's also true for high-income households, although low-income households were spending down that buffer quite a bit more quickly. Um, and so one thing that we're, that we're starting to do is also looking at, looking at these data by race. Um, so using the same data that I've shown you today, the race data, um, and trying to understand how have experiences during the pandemic varied across racial groups, right? We, I mean, we know from public data that there are huge, huge disparities in how the pandemic has affected uh, different racial groups in different communities. Um, I think there's less data, there's less evidence so far, or we just don't know yet how the economic impacts have varied. And so hopefully we'll be able to contribute something to that. Um, but I think, I think looking, looking forward, a lot of what we're hoping to do is kind of continuing to tell the story of the economic fallout of the pandemic, um, you know, both, both in terms of how, in many cases, households' finances have actually improved as a result of the stimulus payments, and also as a result of there being this long period during the during the spring and summer, where you really couldn't go out and spend because businesses were shut down. And so, for the four households that remained employed, the combination of stimulus payments and uh, the combination of stimulus payments and fewer opportunities to spend actually allowed them to build up a liquid asset buffer. For unemployed families, the generous unemployment insurance at least temporarily allowed some amount of liquid asset buffer buildup. Um, but obviously going forward, there are just a lot of questions about whether folks will be able to find work again as more and more folks are experiencing longer term unemployment, you know, it becomes harder and harder. Um, kind of their, their skills tend, there's loss of skills or attrition of skills. And so it becomes harder and harder 
for folks to get back into the labor force. And so I think these are all questions that we're interested in answering. Yeah, absolutely. And I think to, you know, understanding which jobs will be, you know, available or, you know, how our employer is going to kind of think about um, new opportunities too, as we see um, so many changes um, within industries. Um, we've got another question um, about is the JP Morgan Chase um, Institute open for unique or customized research requests and how um, could you begin this process? The answer is no. Uh, I'm, I apologize. Um, we yeah, yeah. So the, the answer is no, and I think I think the reason is that I mean we, we love we love engaging with folks like all of you, right? I mean, and 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 in fact, the research that we do, um, we do it precisely to inform, you know, policy leaders, business leaders, nonprofits, and so on. Um, because I do think there's you know the the way I usually put it is that even if you were to bring together all of the best economists in the world, if they didn't have access to this incredibly rich data set of transaction level bank data. Um, they wouldn't be able to answer a lot of questions. And so we, we're really, really blessed with this amazing data set that allows us to, to provide information about the US economy, about households, about small businesses. Um, and so we all, we liking, so I, I will pass on my email and we love engaging with folks, um, just kind of getting your ideas about what you think would be interesting. We don't do customized research because kind of our mission is precisely to do research for the public and, and to use our data to inform the public as best as we can and to inform as many people as possible. No, I think that's great and so helpful, but um, I think we'd love to continue to kind of share what we're hearing from um, workforce developers and individuals um, throughout the state, but we certainly appreciate um, the, the work that y'all are doing. Um, you know, I think one thing, you know, that we think about too, um, you know, from a workforce development perspective is, you know, we see how this is impacting adults and families, um, but I think we can't lose sight of the fact that our future generation, you know, our, our kids that, you know, kind of don't have the decision-making power about how their parents spend funds and, you know, all of yeah. those things, but we certainly know that the impact um, is huge. So, I mean, are there kind of things that we can think about to make sure that we're um, supporting the future generations um, kind of what financial opportunities to support those students um, so that once they do get into a position where they can think about technical college or um, a university or pursuing um, a career, you know, what kind of financial realities should we be thinking about, about what might need to be different to make sure these students do get into a, a good pipeline for um, long-term success? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a good question, I think. I'll say a couple of things. One is that, um, so again, kind of if the theme of the theme of this whole presentation today, I would say, is that or the, the reason it matters is that what are really often pretty short-term events like unemployment or like a tax refund, um, the, the reason that those events potentially matter is that they can carry through to having large, longer-term consequences. And so similarly, when you think about some of the programs that the, that have been in place during the pandemic, whether that's expanded unemployment insurance or uh, the stimulus payments or, or the PPP, um, right? All of these programs are of course, not just supporting workers, but also supporting their families um, and so, and their children. And so we actually, we actually put out, we, we did an estimate a few months ago, estimating what share of unemployed workers um, also in our data also have families. And we think the number is at least 40% and it's probably higher. Um, so. That's one. That's sort of just an obvious thing, right? With that, when we think about employment programs, whether it's PPP, whether it's unemployment insurance, whether it's workforce development, you know, the benefits. The benefits um, also carry through to, to to the children of the workers. Uh, as far as like the, the broader question that you're asking about, kind of creating opportunities, um, you know, allowing young people to get into a pipe to 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 find a a path um, to going to school, to finding a career, and so on. Um, I'm not sure how much I have new to say about that. I mean, we, we've we've done some research um, on student loans um, and just kind of, you know, identifying that for a very small portion, for a pretty a small portion of the population, um, student loans can be a, you know, can be a kind of a meaning a meaningful burden. Um, but I I think you know I th I think kind of the, the broader answer is that. You know, the, sort, the sorts of debates and, and discussions that, that you folks probably all have uh, in your communities and that, you know, happen in Washington and in Atlanta at the, at the state level and at the local level. Um, 
you know, try just try to bring as much information to the, to those debates and discussions as you can, um, and you know, think about what policies that you can put in place uh, to 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 help kids find a find a path forward. I mean, um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm not sure how much more I have to say on on, on that, um, but but I'm glad you're asking the question. And I think I, I will say one other thing actually, which is that I think in the same the first question I asked Daniela about kind of how can employers help help their employees to save. Right, you can imagine posing the same question about things like technical college, and so you know, providing information to employer employees about opportunities for their kids, I think, is is always a good thing and always welcome, and can potentially have a really positive impact. Yeah, I know so many of our employers do try to offer tuition assistance for people that are working so they can continue their education. Um, we've got our great Hope Career Grants in the program. Um, and then I know, too, we're really excited about a new um, pilot program to expand some um, gap funding and, and specific um, last miles for kids that are in college. So they can finish their degrees, um, which we've been really grateful for. And I think Georgia State University has been a, a true um, pioneer in that. And I think the technical college system also has a system through their foundation to do some of that last mile. Um, I'll give everyone just another minute or a couple of minutes to think about any last questions they might have, but, um, Max, any just closing thoughts for us about, you know, how to make sure that we think about, um, I think your message about really the short term, you know, daily activities really do impact, um, long-term economic success. And maybe if we think about, you know, these short things, we won't have to think about kind of the, the giant elephant that comes at the end of all of this. Any um, just closing thoughts? Um, and if we get any other questions, I'll be sure to share those as well. Yeah, well, again, I mean, thank you all so much for, uh, for, for, for attending and I hope it's been interesting. I think, um, I, I, think, I think the closing thought is just that it's, it's interesting to think about this research and I think the research has become even more relevant during the pandemic. And so as you think about kind of the, the, the points that I made today about, unemploy about unemployment and about responses, spending responses to tax refunds, you can think about how all of those things kind of factor into your own views uh, with about, about all the policies that the government has in instituted during the pandemic. So whether that's expanded unemployment insurance, whether that's stimulus payments, right? The stimulus payments are very, very similar to these tax refund payments in many ways. Um, and so, um, I think one, well, again, I think one takeaway, when we wrote this report, we, we published this report before the pandemic. And so we didn't know that it would actually turn out that the, that the, that the, uh, the learnings for would be, would in fact be so relevant in 2020 and in 2021, but in fact they are. And so I think that as you think about the impacts of all these government programs that have only been instituted in the last several months during the pandemic, um, there's, there's, they do interact with racial disparities and, uh, I, I think that wouldn't necessarily be obvious without without this presentation. It certainly wouldn't have been obvious to me. Um, and so, you know, going forward as we think about um, not just the pandemic, but think about potentially changing the unemployment insurance system or changing tax policies in the longer run, um, you can hopefully think about this report as kind of providing some information for how those changes in unemployment policy or in tax policy um, don't just matter kind of for the economy as a whole uh, and for household finances in general, but actually might interact with racial disparities as well. Absolutely, and we're looking forward to seeing that new research coming out next week. Um, so we'll keep everyone posted on that. Um, but I think, you know, as we really all, you know, strive to build um, a more inclusive economy that promotes prosperity for Georgians across the state, we want to make sure that we are acknowledging where those gaps exist so that we can better support families um, to to meet um, the goals that we have for for all of us. Um, so, Amy, we'll turn it over to you to do closing remarks and um, talk about Max membership as well. Thanks again, Max. Thank you. Yes, Max, thank you so much. This has been a fabulous presentation. And I, I gotta say, I really love how you kind of showed the, the disparities, but also when you take out the buffer, that piece and neutralize it, that the behaviors are the same. It's a, it's a reflection of limited choices when you have limited resources. And um, so thank you for sharing that. And I, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't say, um, our Max Data Council will probably be reaching out because we've had a lot of, um, uh, several of them have um, already chimed in with their questions and it's very um, interesting data. So don't be surprised if you hear from them. So thank you for joining us. Um, 
now if I can get my, there we go. Awesome. So we have got um, one last reminder. If you haven't joined Max, please go ahead and do that. Uh, as you can see, we've got lots of wonderful content coming to you regularly through the Max Minutes, but we also have Max Academy, Max Talks coming up in both in uh, this quarter yet. Um, and then we've got, um, you know, participation in the provider council, data council, leadership network. So lots of, of value there to being involved in Max. Um, and then we've got our next Max Minutes, which will be February 29th, um, is Dr. Stephen Pruitt, um, uh, Impacts of Georgia's Workforce. Um, so from, and Dr. Stephen Pruitt is with SREB. And again, as always, thank you, Daniela, for the fabulous work you do on um, bringing us such quality content for our Max Minutes platform. So uh, with that, uh, final thank you to our sponsors, and I hope you all have a great weekend. And I think the weather, there's going to be some nice weather, so <laughs> we can get out and enjoy it this weekend. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.